right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the Story Slam tonight. My name is Amanda Allen. I am the Director of Communications and Office Management at NYACP. And I would like to recognize our partner in this, Northwell Health and the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine, um, our, our co-sponsors for this every year. You know, this is a topic advocacy for advocating for our patients that, you know, we want to inspire people to do that. So I would love to share with each other, um, you know, let the storytellers experience um, how they've inspired you or share your own experiences about patient advocacy. And um, with that, what we'll do tonight is we'll introduce um, a storyteller and then um, we'll have everybody tell their stories and then we'll hold discussion. And I'm going to stop the recording for the discussion part so that we can feel free to discuss uh, openly without um, any hesitation of being recorded. So I'm going to invite uh, Dr. S uh, Shane Solger to share his story first. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shane. <clears throat> I'm an emergency medicine and internal medicine resident at Kings County. I'm a PGY4. And uh, I'm also uh, one of the executive uh, board members at CIR. And that just plays a little bit of a role in terms of like why I was as engaged with CIR um, and, the, and their role that they play in the story. So the, the story itself is has a lot to do with the demographic around Kings County and SUNY Downstate. We have about 70,000 people who speak Haitian Creole in our county uh, and about 34 per, uh, 34,000 or roughly about half of them, they um, can't speak it efficiently enough to be able to communicate their medical information. Um, and so if you look at the demographics of our hospital, it's the second most uh, commonly encountered language that we see other than English. And so uh, the story kind of started after um, I was a PGY2 and having practiced both in internal medicine and emergency medicine, uh, my frustration was really mounting after I kept having these, um, these interactions with Haitian Creole speaking patients in hallway beds or hallway chairs where we were, you know, going back and forth with our telephones and they were essentially shouting their medical information into the interpreter, into my cell phone. And then, you know, after the second or third time that the call dropped and we were reintroducing another interpreter, um, you know, that, that it wasn't fair to the patient um, to kind of get put in that, that position in addition to being a vulnerable person as a patient. Um, and so we had these um, monthly meetings and I brought that up. And it wasn't just me, as it turned out. Uh, it was a little bit more ubiquitous. And so some of my ob guy and colleagues were talking about how they were coaching a lot of these women through birth, uh, childbirth with a cell phone in their ear. I was talking with some of the surgeons who brought up two issues, one of which was that we have a lot of patients who end up with um, like laryngeal cancers. So they weren't able to speak and the surgeons also couldn't read their lips. And so that was another issue of having somebody not in person to talk with them. But also we were having a lot of emergency and um, urgent surgeries that were coming in overnight. And there was nobody to speak with them because the other issue was that at, at that time, Haitian Creole was only available from uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So as soon as 8 p.m. hit, we had nobody. Um, we were just uh, you know hopping on Seracom as our, our preferred vendor. And so what we did was we collected a list from most of the departments to include my department, both in internal medicine and emergency medicine, obstetrics, the surgical subspecialties. And we took it to our uh, administrators, kind of expecting them to respond uh, like positively. Um, but unfortunately, they let us know that they were going to give us 30 minutes of their time. And throughout that 30 minutes, they were pretty dismissive. Yeah, uh, they said that they didn't have the money to, nor was there any plan to get money for in-person or better video interpretation services. So um, to say that I was angry by the response would be, you know, selling a little bit short. Um, but I remember right afterwards, I reached out to my political coordinator and I said, we have to talk to our city council member. And um, so we reached out to the city council member at New York City who takes care of Kings County. Um, and I remember we were, uh, we were sitting with Rita Joseph and we were telling her the same exact stories that we were telling our administrators. And you could see that she was just frantically texting, um, her staffers to do something about it. And at the, uh, the end of that, that meeting, what it, what happened was she ended up writing a, a letter to the CEO of my hospital, kind of outlining all the issues that we were having to include lack of interpretation services overnight for our second most common language that we see. 
Um, we had a lot of cellular dead zones. So a lot of our calls were getting dropped, especially in the middle of the night. We didn't have anybody in person for those urgent or emergent situations. Um, so we're a level one trauma center. So people were getting shot, you know, hit they're on scooters, getting hit by cars. And I found myself in one instance asking if anybody knew Creole. And then we kind of def defaulted to, does anybody know French at least? And we were shouting at this man in French. Um, and so she sent that letter and he, he again replied, there was no plan for increasing funds. And so this was probably around the same time that I was the New York um, ACP advocacy intern as well. And I got a chance to speak with the uh, New York State Deputy of Health um, Commit or the New York State Department of Health Deputy Commissioner. And unfortunately, she would get promoted from that role. So that kind of like hit a dead end. Um, but I was also able to talk with um, uh, Dr. Eileen Barrett out of New Mexico, who had accomplished what I was trying to accomplish uh, in New Mexico with Navajo, where she was. And so I was able to talk with her to kind of see how she uh, created an environment that was receptive to improved interpretation services. Um, and so while I was working on some of those things, we were also working on kind of growing our coalition. And so we were able to get the, um, in addition to Rita Joseph, who's our city council member, we were also able to get the chairs on the committee of hospitals, the chairs on the, um, the committee on immigration and the chair on the committee of health to sign on to a letter that they sent, then sent to the CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals, as well as the CEO of my hospital that said the same exact thing. Um, that they were concerned about the interpretation services at our hospital for the Haitian Creole speaking patients. And we really didn't hear much about what the city council members did for us was they, at the budgetary hearing for New York City Health and Hospitals, they brought it up and they asked our CEO, Dr. Katz, you know, what was going on in this hospital in central Brooklyn with regards to interpretation access. And he was actually um, initially saying that it was adequate but we were able to have residents testify that it wasn't and provide the same kind of anecdotal stories that uh, I had provided and we all had provided to the city council members. And they were also armed with those stories, the, the ones that didn't get brought up in the testimony. And so they were also kind of able to come back and say, well, we really don't think that it is uh, appropriate. And so the what happened from that meeting, though, that was publicly televised was within two weeks, we went from 12 hours a day of video interpreter services for Haitian Creole to 24 hours. Um, they purchased approximately 60 new Stratus, um, which is our our vendor for the um, the video interpretation services. Uh, so they they also um, started advert uh, they started advertising for MIST training, which is essentially to turn um, kind of like staff into medical interpreters. They're willing to fund that. It's about a I think a 500 or a 600 dollar course. So we have. Um, as far as I am aware, 22 were supposed to have graduated in January. They created a um, a language core, a Haitian Creole language core, and they also created a position called the, um, I think it's the Assistant Director of Language uh, Services. And so, the, and then there was just kind of like a, a culture shift at Kings County too, um, where if you like walk into the lobby, there were these videos that were playing on loop that said, you know, we speak your language, there were posters up, there was um, like these loop videos would also provide you with the number to call um, if you wanted to get in touch with an interpreter. And also was working in the um, the ambulatory clinics. And you could just see we went from absolutely nothing to these like stratus or these, um, they're, they're green, so they're, they're pretty noticeable. They just like started piling up. Um, and so uh, right now we're still waiting. They, uh, New York City Health and Hospitals has allocated three permanent staff member lines for in-person interpreters that they're still trying to fill, but they're there. And so we kind of consider that to be the win is that they have said that we're going to fund uh, in-person interpreters as opposed to just relying on, you know, nurses or PCAs or clerks that have received this extra training to be um, certified interpreters. And so that's kind of where we're at now, where we're waiting for a lot of these things to get implemented. Um, and so uh, the due date for the uh, the MIST certification was January, so we're kind of waiting to hear back. But overall, um, this just kind of tells the story about how, you know, with New York ACP, with um, CIR, my union, we were able to advocate for the needs of our patients and our communities. Um, and I think that's my story. Thank you, Dr. Silger. Uh, thanks for the plug for NYACP as well. <laughs> um, I think it's a great example of how voices came together to literally be the voices for other people. Um, so that is a wonderful story and a great success story of 
where you, how far you guys went, um, and, and who you turned to and what you could do together, right? The power of physician and resident voices is pretty wonderful. Um, and I just want, I know we're going to do this discussion, um, after the stories, but, you know, start thinking about, um, you know, is that a way you've advocated before? Is that a way that you'd consider advocating now that you heard about what came out of it? Um, so did that inspire something new in you? Um, so think about that for the discussion part. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Silger, again. Um, let's go uh, to Miss Jamima DeMong. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Dr. Silger, for sharing that story. That is... Um dear to my heart because I'm a first generation Haitian American. So to hear the advocacy and I'm familiar with Councilwoman Rita Joseph. So to hear that she continues to do great work is quite exciting. And to hear the advocacy, especially from physicians and residents um, is quite impactful as you all can see. And I also wanna thank um, Dr. Black for continuing this partnership. Again, my name is Jamima Demang. I am representing Health Solutions with Norfolk Health. And we are gonna share a story from the Hofstra Norfolk Medical Legal Partnership. This medical legal partnership is uh, a partnership not only with Hofstra University, but within departments in uh, Norfolk Health across the health system. So it is not only health solutions, it's health homes, it's centers and equity of care as well. So I'll go in and read the story now. Patient E, as a 34-year-old single mother of three very young children. In fact, the day that we tried to perform her intake in November, E was in labor, giving birth to her third child. E came to us as an emergency case from her care manager, DC. This care manager is a health home case management serving adults care manager who zealously advocated on E's behalf to become a MLP client, a medical legal partnership client, where in MLP assists with health harming legal needs and followed along closely with E's case. E has not been able to work since 2020 due to debilitating mental health diagnosis, such as PTSD, anxiety, depression, and OCD. Additionally, she dropped out of school in the eighth grade. E has a long history of trauma that stems from her childhood in the foster care system, which still impacts her to this day. E came to us because she wanted to understand why her social security disability survivorship benefits were passed down that were passed down from her adoptive mother were cut off without any explanation. She was desperately needing these benefits to take care of her children. We applied for social security disability back in November of 2023, had the proper documentation filled out by her psychiatrist, and after many follow-up phone calls, he was actually approved finally for social security disability benefits in January 23rd of 2024. This was such a great relief for E. Her voice was excited and also filled with peace. She found out that she was approved and incredibly grateful for her care manager DC support and advocating for her and also the MLP for providing her with the assistance with gaining and activating, reinstating the social security disability benefits on her behalf. We wanna end the story saying that we're all grateful to be a part of the MLP and to be able to assist those who need it most. So that is my slam story. Thank you so much, Jamima. Appreciate you coming and sharing and giving us a new perspective on another uh, part of the team that can help patients. Um, it's, it's great. It's wonderful that she was grateful to be a part of it and that uh, you in turn were grateful to help her. And I think that's what, you know, takes advocacy to the next level, right? Everybody working together. Absolutely. It's the cross collaboration that happens 
with medical and legal. Yeah, that's wonderful. Marriage. Yes. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for being here. And, and I think that brings a great question to start thinking about for the discussion. Did this give you a new view of advocacy um, and advocating for patients and maybe a, a new um, resource that is available that you didn't know about? Um, so thank you for bringing that forward. Um, next, we have Dr. Uh, Brunius. Hi, everyone. I've been having problems with my camera, so I hope nobody got a headache just seeing the camera moving up and down. So uh, my name is Magali Bronios. Um, I'm one of the hospitalists at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is a cancer hospital um, at uh, in New York City. And uh, my story um, is a little bit more um, on a, pers a, a type of personal advocacy. So I really appreciate the two stories that were previously told, you know, first with uh, Dr. Shane Sogler talking about the importance of interpreter. And then uh, Ms. Uh, Demang, I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, for the uh, social um, importance of social services. I think we can all agree in this room that um, in addition to making sure that our patients have optimized health, um, having the support necessary can have a tremendous value and the ability to even communicate because sometimes if you can't communicate, you can misdiagnose and the patients themselves, they can um, have all kinds of complications, including delirium. So uh, my story of personal advocacy is, um, you know, I am a, a hospitalist by training, as I mentioned, but also uh, I'm boarded in palliative medicine. So a lot of the times, the patients that we take care of in the hospital are patients who are very ill, and we often see the ones who are not responding to treatment and the ones who are basically on the edge of going to hospice. Uh, every once in a while, though, we do get patients who otherwise could have done very well, but for one reason or the other, they don't they don't have enough support system at home. Uh, they don't have the resources to have a uh, home care and so on. So as a result, because of, of the delay in trying to get the system set up in a way that can support them, these patients can develop progression of disease and then by then it's too late. So um, the story is kind of long and I don't know if we have enough time, um, if I should read it or if I should just tell you, what do you think, Amanda? Because um, it's already six and I wanna give people time. Should I just give the synopsis? I'm, How I'm long do you think it is? Um, well, when I timed myself, it was about seven minutes, but- <laughs> That's fine. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So by all accounts and appearances, it was a gloomy afternoon in June. And as I prepared to enter my patient's room, I remember feeling apprehensive and deeply sad about her clinical situation. Miss Na is a very pleasant 42-year-old woman, former smoker with a past medical history of Graves' disease who had recently been diagnosed with metastatic gastric adenocarcinoma. She was sent from clinic due to failure to thrive. She was emaciated, weak, unable to tolerate an oral diet due to nausea, poor um, vomiting, and poor appetite. Her scans were significantly concerning for uh, linitis plastica and peritoneal carcinomatosis. Both of these um, markers essentially meant that um, she had progressive uh, disease, unlikely to tolerate a diet and uh, may further um, decompensate and would require essentially uh, TPN in order to support her during chemotherapy. Um, my experience um, practicing uh, in a major urban center has made me accustomed to seeing what we typically call the unbefriended patient or the person who lacks family or friend support in the community, such as Ms. Na. In fact, 
studies have shown that patients who lack caregivers during critical illness tend to have worse outcomes. Such patients typically have extraordinary challenges in undergoing, maintaining, or adjusting to chemotherapy treatments, given the burden of repeated clinic visits, need for labs, and follow-ups necessary. I walked in the room thinking that in her case, um, it was very heartbreaking, but unfortunately, it wasn't uncommon. This was a case where she was declining, she was losing weight, and was not very well connected to the community. What I wasn't expecting was that this turned out to be a life-changing experience for me and my team. As I reflect on the encounter with Ms. Na, I'm realizing the importance of maintaining hope and a clinician's role in patient advocacy. Ms. Na greeted me with a big, bright, and beautiful uh, bulging eyes and a grinning smile. Despite a very small frame, she had a very strong and determined voice. I was struck by how intelligent and hopeful she was. While realizing her predicament was serious and life-limiting enough to warrant medical attention, she had strong hopes of receiving effective treatment that would prolong her survival and allow her to have good quality of life for as long as possible. We discussed the inherent challenges of going through the ordeal of treatment while living alone, especially in her current debilitated state. She emphatically exclaimed that although there was no family at home, that she had an extensive network of support through her neighbors who lived in her building. Although I was skeptical at first about the extent of help that a New Yorker would provide. You know, she lived in a New York City apartment and had only lived in the United States for about three years at this point. And so I reluctantly agreed. I, I asked her to um, talk with her neighbors and have them come in so we could discuss uh, goals of care and plan of care moving forward. As I prepared for the day ahead, I also spoke with her family overseas. Um, as I mentioned, I, you know, she was from Ukraine. So um, I coordinated with uh, the family who was overseas and also contacted a healthcare proxy who was living out of state in Virginia, just to uh, make sure that they would also be able to attend virtually um, the family meeting. So we basically, the next day we had a Zoom meeting with the um, family away, um, as well as the neighbors. So the next day, we proceeded with the meeting and we arranged for uh, the healthcare proxy and the family to join by Zoom. And as we waited for the neighbors to come in, one by one they came and eventually all four of them came and advocated for Ms. Na um, as they began to discuss amongst themselves how they would divide up the responsibilities in caring for her during her cancer treatment. Everyone had a chance to ask questions about expectations and contingencies. One of the neighbors was a licensed practical nurse who was already volunteering her teenage daughter to help as well. Um, the daughter was um, learning to be a nursing assistant and she was more than happy to, he to help as well. Um, after about two and a half hours of discussion, because as you can imagine, we also had to use an interpreter uh, because um, there were family from uh, overseas. We came up with a plan and the plan was we were going to continue to support uh, Ms. Na with uh, artificial nutrition while she continues uh, with the chemotherapy in hope that she would um, get better. And um, what amazes me the most about this case was um, I was uh, humbled by how many people actually showed up for her. Um, what this told me was this was someone who had an incredible spirit, someone who was very vulnerable, kind, and open to sharing the human experiences to a point where she actually had neighbors that she had only met for a couple of years who come in and actually said, yes, I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna be able to help this person. And all it took was for our team to, to talk with the patient and try to gather all the, the, different, um, the, the different people together. Um, the reason why this case uh, to me was um, particularly um, 
interesting was not only because um, of how the patient uh, was able to connect with other people and got um, her neighbors to advocate for her, uh, but also for the fact that the outcome could have been completely different. So had we waited a month or two, uh, we would have been talking about something completely different. So to essentially uh, conclude the story, um, I have to say that um, Miss Na eventually did very well. She continued with her cancer-directed therapy. Uh, she received the uh, TPN and eventually had to have a, a palliative DPEG in the interim because of the linitis uh, plastica, which is a, a form of uh, infiltration of cancer in the stomach. And eventually, um, the patient, uh, she ended up doing very well. Uh, she's now um, doing artwork. She's presenting at galleries. She invited us to an art show um, and she's actively thriving. And this is thanks to um, us being able to connect with her neighbors and her neighbors also having the compassion. And I have to say that I think it also, it's also her personality. So I thought that, you know, um, it's great that we have organizations, but every once in a while taking the extra time just to advocate for a patient can mean so much. Uh, because um, wait, if we had waited just a, a few more weeks, then we would have had to kind of like just discuss hospice and and um, kind of think about making her um, comfort care. So at the end of the day, um, that that story kind of stayed with me and reminded me that uh, it's very important to maintain hope. And although a patient may seem unfriended at first always take the extra time to figure out what's going on with the patient. Although the interpreter could take several hours, which in our situation it did, but it ended up be being a very life-changing experience for the patient. Thank, thank you, Dr. Brinius. You, uh, thank you for taking the time for her and for sharing that story because it literally changed the course of her life. And I love how you brought up that, you know, part of being an advocate is having hope, right? Um, you see it, you have hope. Um, and you made those, she had the connections, but you brought them together. So um, you definitely played a, a large role in that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and Dr. Robin Dibner, you are up next. I'm on mute, of course. Thank you. I um, I had misunderstood a little bit about what this was, was going to be about. So I actually wrote a short story based on a, a true experience. And thank you very much, Amanda, for allowing me to read it. I'm calling it The Empress, circa 1977. She clicked her improbably long nails against the bed rail rhythmically, a metronome marking her prolonged misery. Most were straight like razor clams, but a few spiraled on themselves like other mollusks. Another one, she eyed me suspiciously through her sagging lids, not hostile, resigned. I knew what she meant another inexperienced white coat there to prod her. I gripped my clipboard and tried not to shrink. I'm the medical student assigned to your case. I'll do my best to try to take care of you. She sighed softly. The resident's instructions rang in my ears. I'm giving you a patient, the vulvar cancer on ward two. She's yours. Balance her lights, her eyes and nose, write the notes. I don't want to see her and keep the nurses off my back. I couldn't believe he was serious. Got it. I was shocked by his misplaced trust in my ability, a third year student. But after reviewing Christina Blackwell's chart, it hit me hard. Not trust. He didn't know me. But now I recognize that to him, the patient and I had much in common pitiful, female, 
unworthy of his attention. It was difficult to see past her nails. The chipped Chinese red polish had grown out a quarter of their four inch length, measuring her disability like rings in a felled tree trunk. Everything else was thin, steel wool hair, face, limbs. She was tied to the bed rails with soft wrist restraints, half wrapped in tangled sheets and a hospital gown slipping from her shoulders. You've got to help me, she pleaded. It's the nurses. They hate me. I stiffened and took a deep breath. They want to cut my nails, she hissed. See these? Pointing to the dingy gauze restraints. They say they have to keep me tied up so I don't scratch. Scratch what? The stench hit me before I could comprehend what I was seeing as she pulled up the sheets. A fungating mass protruded between her wasted thighs, devouring her from below. I won't let them cut me down there. No, ma'am. And they're mad. But it's my nails make them crazy. I covered her and remembered to resume breathing. They are pretty amazing. How long have you had them? Years. Can't polish them now. Shame. She closed her eyes and almost smiled. They were so pretty. A, a nurse walked up to the foot of the bed. Oh, good. A new student. You can change your dirty bandage twice a shift. We'll be back to cut those nails later, your highness, she threatened. The patient turned her head to the wall. See? Why they want to do me like that? And she moaned softly. Are you having pain? You saw it. What do you think? I didn't notice what you're on for pain. I'll go check the orders. Don't bother. It ain't there. What? Anything for pain. I'm a junkie. Clean for a while, but always a junkie to them. Anyway, no surgery, no pain meds. I told you I won't let them butchers cut me. Click, click, click of the nails. What's Miss Blackwell's story? I asked at the nursing station. Christina thinks she's something. Junkie, alcoholic, prostitute, cancer, nasty. What else do you need to know? What's up with the restraints? She really can't move. Got to restrain her, else she scratches and infects that thing. It's always oozing and smells to high heaven. She won't let them debris it. I don't know why she's here anyway, not doing anything for me. She seems to really care about those nails. I tried to sound neutral. You got that right. She's crazy. Scratch two nurses and an orderly bad. We've been wanting to cut them, but it would take security and who knows what clippers. Maybe she could be knocked out for it, she mused. Does anyone ever visit? No. Somehow I found the courage to say that maybe they're all she's got left. The remainder of my three-week GYN clerkship at the old Detroit Receiving has largely evaporated from my memory. But bearing witness to the ongoing power struggle between the harshly judgmental nurses and my vulnerable patient deeply disturbed me. I defended her against their manicure plans in every way I could acutely aware of my inadequacies. The day I rotated off the service, Ms. Blackwell still had her phenomenal nails. And on my watch, the resident had never seen her. Thank you. That was a wonderful story. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you came and shared that. <laughs> um, and thank you for bringing a little small feedings to the story slam too. But mm -hmm. I think um, with the most, we talk a lot about reducing uh, stigma and things and you were doing it then. And I think that's, you know, I'm hoping her, the long nails are as beautiful as, as you uh, actually t being an advocate for her and reducing that stigma and, um, making sure that people listened to her and what was important to her. Um, and you saw her and think that's what that story told me. Um, so I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm.